Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, if you've been following me, you know that every Wednesday at four o'clock, we've been hosting a, a town hall meeting as an opportunity to really bring us together as a community. And more importantly, to give you the opportunity to ask questions that are impacting all of our lives, things that are important to our values and, and what we hold dear. We've been having these conversations every week and really looking at how our life, how do we manage life and how do we advocate for the things that are important to us through the lenses of COVID-19. This pandemic has impacted all of us in the most unbelievable ways, uh, although we know that the suffering is not impacting us equally. For those of you who have been struggling and who are deeply feeling the isolation and the loss of friends, the loss of life, the loss of a way of existing. Um, I, I wanna say, I am sorry. It doesn't feel like you're in this together with others, but you are. You're surrounded by a community of people who love you and who wanna support you. If you need help and you need support, please reach out to someone who, who knows you. If you don't know who to reach out, please feel free to call me, to email my office. We are happy to connect with you. Um, I also want to say to those in the community who've been really working really hard to wear those face coverings and keeping their social distance, I want to say thank you. It is not easy, but I can tell you that it's working. We are flattening the curve, uh, and that's the good news. The good news is that we have helped protect our frontline workers at our hospitals who are working really hard to save lives. Um, now, the challenging news is we need to keep doing it because we only, the curve is only as flat as we continue to be vigilant about how we keep ourselves and each other safe. I know we can do this because we've shown each other we can do this. I wanna say uh, a very special welcome to four people who um, I have an enormous amount of respect for, and I'm so grateful to be walking in this world with them. Um, each of them hold values and have uh, a career in really um, deeply impacting, I think so many of the things and the values and the people that our community cares about. We're gonna have the opportunity to really talk about what has the criminal justice system looked like for those who are being impacted um, under this pandemic and through the lens of COVID-19. For people who are incarcerated, what are the challenges and the obstacles they face? What do we need to do differently? What does the court system look like? And, and what does criminal justice look like right now through the lenses of COVID-19? And do we need to reimagine um, what justice looks like for those who become justice involved? Um, so I could not have a, a better group of people to really talk about that, particularly as it impacts us here in Massachusetts and who've been doing incredible work for years. Um, and now more than ever, their voices, their experience and their advocacy is, um, is needed more than ever. So I wanna first welcome, um, we have our district attorney, the Middlesex DA. Many of you know her, she's not a stranger. Um, Mary and Ryan, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for all of your work. And we're gonna get into a lot of what you do in just a minute. I also want to say a very special thank you to, while he doesn't live in Cambridge, we still think of him, I think of him as a brother in Cambridge because um, he has such deep roots here. So I want to say welcome to Rasan Hall, who is the director of the Racial Justice Program for the American Civil Liberties Union. Welcome, Rasan. It's really great to have you here. I also want to say a very special thank you to Peter Katujan, who is the, the Middlesex County Sheriff, also not a stranger. Um, prior, prior to becoming the, the sheriff, uh, Peter was also a state representative, and I remember meeting him when he was just a candidate running for state representative. Um, so somebody who I've always also long admired and appreciated his values and his advocacy. And then also I wanna say thank you to Liz Matos. Liz is the executive director of the Prisoners, Prisoners Legal Services of Massachusetts, and really has been doing incredible advocacy and speaking truth to justice on behalf of so many families in Massachusetts and those who are justice involved um, with the criminal justice system and really holding us accountable and ensuring that in fact, um, justice really is understood in ways that heal and allow people to move on with their lives. Um, and, and that's a larger conversation that I, I really look forward to having with you, Liz. Thank you for all of your incredible work and the opportunities that I have to work with you on legislation. So with that, I, I have, uh, we have questions that have been lining up already here, um, but I'm going to just open this up. We have uh, 56 minutes together and this time flies by, but I wanna make sure we get time to get to as many questions as possible and that you also have the opportunity to really speak to what is on your mind. So I'm gonna start with each of you and I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about through the lenses of this pandemic and COVID-19, um, and, and who you are responsible for caring for, advocating, and walking with 
what keeps you up? Um, where are we um, in terms of the work and the people that you are the most connected to in your roles? And, um, and we're going to get into a conversation about where, where, what are we doing well and what do we need to do different and what do we need to do better? So I, I'm going to start with Liz Matos, um, who I think has been really doing an incredible job at trying to communicate all of this to many of us in positions who, um, who need to hear this. Liz, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. It's really an honor. Uh, not just to be part of this, but to be um, in such wonderful company of such amazing people who have in, in their own ways contributed to any improvements that we've seen uh, for incarcerated individuals over the last few months. So I, I thank everyone for their efforts. Um, and I guess I just would want to start by answering your question, which is what keeps me up at night. And uh, you know, I receive emails and phone calls from family members on a daily basis more so than we did before. Uh, and that's because people are very understandably very scared for their loved ones because they're hearing from their loved ones and they have people who are very medically compromised, people who are uh, who have cancer, who have uh, very uh, scary chronic conditions. And as most people know, uh, folks who are incarcerated disproportionately suffer from chronic health conditions and are disproportionately elderly. So there are many family members who uh, know that their loved ones are due home within weeks or months or even one or two years and are afraid that that won't happen because, um, because they feel like the pandemic is not being taken seriously in prisons and jails. And I, I also wanna start by, by saying that um, it is different, which you've already highlighted Representative Decker about um, how each of the counties are doing things differently. And even with, throughout the DOC, as we see the numbers vary drastically in terms of the infection rates from facility to facility, and that's because there are also differences. So, um, you know, not every place is doing the same thing, but we, what we are still seeing is as testing uh, increases, and as we do do universal testing, we can see that the infection numbers are going up, of course. Um, we're at, with uh, folks who are incarcerated and folks who work in prisons and jails, we're at about 900 um, positive cases, according to the most recent report. Um, and, and there are lots of issues with the reporting as well, and the counties is far, far less testing. And as many saw in the reports yesterday and today, Hampton County is now on lockdown too. So what keeps me up at night is seeing those numbers continue to go up, um, but also uh, not wanting to hear about another death of a client inside. We've had nine already in the state of Massachusetts and we rank among the highest in the country for deaths um, due to COVID um, of incarcerated people. And also I, what the biggest concern I'll say right now or most immediate concern is suicidality and uh, the very acute mental health state of many people who are incarcerated because of the very prolonged lockdown. And many of the county jails, but um, especially the Department of Correction has been on 23 hour, 23 and a half hour lockdown for eight weeks straight now. Um, and we've had a couple of suicides already in the last couple of months and a number of people calling us saying that they watched a cellmate or they watched someone across the cell from them um, cutting themselves, trying to hang themselves. And we're getting these calls on almost a daily basis, quite honestly. And, uh, and people who have acute mental health conditions are not getting the same access, uh, at least in the DOC from what we're hearing, to mental health services because of the lockdown and because of COVID. So those are some very real concerns that I think keep all of us up at night and have us working um, more than we have um, before all of this transpired. Um, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Liz. And, you know, I have a meeting tomorrow with the Secretary of uh, Department of Corrections tomorrow. Um, and we have a lot of questions we've been asking now for quite some time regarding the behavioral health needs of um, people who are incarcerated. Um, so I, I hope to have some more answers and to be able to continue advocating more of what we, we know needs to happen there. So thank you for your advocacy and your work. Um, I would go to our, our DA, Marion Ryan. Um, can you tell me what it looks like? What are the things, the biggest challenges that you see in terms of how the courts are operating? Um, whether or not you think that the our, our arrest down, what does it look like for people who are, um, who 
now are finding themselves, um, you know, whether whether it's arrested or whether that they need to be in court. Um, what is it? What are the obstacles that you're seeing, and what are the changes that you've been able to help advocate for, and where where else do you think we need to go? Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for having me. I want to really sort of in the short time we have together, kind of divide that into three groups, one of which is with the courts. You know, it's been a little misleading for people to hear that the courts are closed. While the physical buildings are closed, courts are open, they're providing protection for people who need restraining orders, all of that sort of thing. We are arraigning people, we're doing all of that. So, and we've done a lot of work about how to spread those resources. So that's one piece, is just letting people know what's going on there. I will say, I think, that to the point of policing and arrest, we are down about 80% in terms of crime. And that's really been with a lot of collaboration with our law enforcement partners. And obviously that's gonna probably change a little bit as people come out more and more. But, and I, I'll talk a little bit at the end about what we can learn from that. But then the second piece, and this is a place where I think for folks, particularly in Middlesex County, we have really become nothing is a perfect result, but really been leaders in the collaboration and cooperation around this. You know, my responsibility is the protection of the public safety of the people in the county. And that includes people that we typically think about that might be outside living their lives, but it certainly includes those people who are detained or incarcerated here as well. It doesn't change because of what side of the V you're on in a case. And really seeing that before we had the shutdown, our office began a collaboration with the Committee for Public Counsel, with our sheriff, to think about what are gonna be the issues here and how can we start to address that. And the work that's been done in Middlesex County is really a testament to that collaboration. We were able to have lots of folks released here long before the court case ordering release. We were at about 100 people. And that is keeping in mind that in Middlesex County, we don't ask for bail initially unless we're gonna ask for committed time. So the number of people that might be held pretrial is already smaller. What has been more of a challenge is those individuals that are serving a sentence. We were part of the special master's report where we asked the Supreme Judicial Court to think about creating an exception for incarcerated people to seek release. The court decided not to do that. So that has made people in DOC custody more of a challenge in terms of seeing people get released. And then in terms of where we go from here, I think we have all been through a lot of learning and a lot of difficulties over these past few weeks. So I want that to mean something for us. And I think when we look at where we are now moving to reopening, because one of the things, as Liz talked about, the suicidality for people, one of the issues is when they sit too long in custody. So how do we start getting people's cases to go forward? balancing the concern of people who have to come in to be jurors and what that's going to look like. And also, what can we learn about what happened? Are there things that we over-police that we could be changing? Can we change the use of remote process for lots of things that we've been doing these last 10 weeks, especially in bad weather situations? And given that we've been able to release people and to the extent they've been successful, what can we learn from that to work into our going forward, how we decide whether people need to be detained? So it really is sort of a looking back where we are and how we're planning to go forward. Thank you. Um, and then I would go to Sheriff Katusian. Um, So uh, Peter, you've been really on the forefront, I think of really um, advocating and innovating for what behavioral health looks like for people who are incarcerated and who are being held in your care. And um, that has been a, a concern for me as the chair of mental health and substance use and recovery, that the behavioral health needs of people who are incarcerated at the time, um, depending on what county they're in. And I think it's important to note that what you do in Middlesex as the um, sheriff who oversees the House of Corrections is very different than somebody who is in Department of Corrections and maybe serving time in prison. And it's also very different than those who are serving time or who are waiting actually um, to go to court who are, are being detained by other sheriffs in different counties. And so I know part of my job is to make sure that the best practices that are strengthening and, and, and supporting people and with the help that they need um, 
to make sure that we actually make sure those are universal throughout the state. And that's not the case. If you could talk a little bit about um, both the, the, the innovative work you've been doing around behavioral health and for people who are really struggling with addiction and really have landed in your custody because we have criminalized addiction. Um, and then also what your challenges are moving forward and what it has looked like for helping people where the courts have allowed, and I know Middlesex started to before the court decision, but when the courts have basically required every House of Correction to release pre-detainees who are not a, a harm or who are not violent or seen as deemed as violent um, or, or a danger to others. Um, if you could just um, help people understand more about, I think that the role that you play as a sheriff, because I think people confuse House of Corrections with prisons and DOC, and also understand um, just you know what it means for you as the Middlesex Sheriff and, and what you are, um, what you're most concerned about it and what you want us to see doing more of around the state. Thank you, Marjorie. And, and it is funny when you mentioned when we first met, it was really it was 1996 when I was first running for office. And uh, I remember meeting you at the Democratic uh, State Convention that year. Uh, and then I followed your career um, for so many years since then. We've worked on so many issues. Uh, and as you know, I was in the legislature for 14 years. I chaired the Committee on Health Care, which at that time uh, was made up of all the committees, mental health and substance use and uh, public health and, and, and health care finance till they broke it out. Um, so these issues were, you know, the things that affect the incarcerated population with me, meth, mental health, uh, physical health, um, substance use disorder, things that I've, I've already had from a different lens and brought in here. Uh, so you're right, the, the, there's a difference between prisons and jails. Prisons are those that are state run. Department of Correction is the example here in Massachusetts. It is those that are assigned generally out of superior court for longer sentences, and they only take sentenced individuals. Houses of corrections take those generally that are sentenced out of the district courts across the state. Uh, we hold people that are sentenced up to two and a half years, and then we, hold, we hold, hold all of our pretrial population, meaning those that are charged on a crime and held on bail or held without bail. What's the difference um, as far as the level of uh, acuity of the individual, probably not much because our pretrial population oftentimes goes up to the Department of Corrections. What, one of the main differences is though, um, that in, in many of our sentence population also have done time in the Department of Corrections at one point, but what is also a big difference in the churning of our population. Uh, we have a lot more people that are leaving to go to the street. We have a lot more people that are coming in. So the constant churning of our population is something that's very different from prisons and creates a, 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 like a real set of needs and yet a real opportunity to provide those people that are in our care, custody and control, to turn their lives around in a shorter time period and the impact on the communities can be so much more so significant. And so what keeps me up at night, missing opportunities to help the individuals in my care kind of become better, stronger members of society, keeping them safe, keeping them healthy, uh, and then turning them back into society with a plan in place so that they can be successful upon their reentry. That's the thing that I love about this job. And COVID-19 hasn't changed that. It's just changed the general metrics by which I have to uh, operate and, and, uh, and change what we've had to do in here and then get to what that goal is, that ultimate goal, but in a different way because of how we need to protect the public health inside our facilities at the same time. Thank you, Peter. Um, and Rasan. Um, I, I first, I think it, it'd be important to note your role in the what a difference a DA makes, right? So you have been raising consciousness, awareness, and helping to advocate and organize, um, educating the public about the, the incredible roles that DAs make. And, and I think that speaks to understanding that we have a criminal justice system that is often shaped by policies and values um, that are both known and unknown that really um, are are racist, quite frankly, and, and classist, right? And they really are disproportionately served to punish the most vulnerable in our society um, and the most um, discriminated. Um, and so that has been an important campaign. I think about the court ruling that just um, has, seems to have indicated that only the governor can decide who should be released, who's currently sentenced. And um, this is an issue that I, I'm working on with, um, you know, the ACLU, I, I do talk to Prisoners Legal Services who's working on it as well, but I know a few of us have been trying to think more through that, 
more through think through this because we also know that what's happening is that um, the crime and the time that people are serving are not equivalent to what is now uh, easily become a death sentence for people who are incarcerated. And that's not what that was ever supposed to be. Um, and so I, I know that this is, um, this is what keeps me up at night. Um, and I would like to just better understand from your point of view, what your concerns are and you know the, the, what you are really every day making an effort to make sure legislators are being held accountable for what are we doing to ensure that it's not a death sentence and that we actually are moving people out um, and not putting them there in the first place. Thank you so much, uh, Rep. Decker. This is uh, an important conversation and I'm so glad that you're having it. Uh, you're right. Uh, the, the, the very racist nature of this criminal legal system uh, has disproportionately impacted people of color, particularly Black people in this country from time immemorial. And it continues. And this COVID crisis has only uh, laid bare the gross racial disparities that exist uh, in this system, not only in the number of people who are dying who are African American, uh, but when we start to think about the crisis that exists in detention facilities, whether it's in the House of Correction or people who are detained pretrial in jail or people who are serving uh, sentences in the Department of Correction, overwhelmingly it is people of color. And you think about the lengthier sentences and Black and Latinx folks are more likely to have uh, these lengthier sentences. And so that is something that certainly keeps me up at night, that keeps me concerned and worried about the, the, the disparate impact uh, that this virus is going to have because we have systems and structures in place uh, that subject people uh, to, to the virus in ways that other people don't. I, it, it sometimes, it seems like it was so long ago, but right before this crisis hit, we were all doing advocacy around uh, uh, attacks on people who were incarcerated by correctional officers at Sousa Baranowski, um, trying to reveal the brutality uh, of the system and trying to get more information and raise awareness about the, the people who live there and their humanity. And sometimes it's hard for the rest of society if they have not been incarcerated or do not have loved ones who are incarcerated to recognize the humanity in the, of the people who are uh, detained or are serving sentences or who are wrongfully convicted or unjustly uh, convicted. And, and that's something that we just kind of forgot about that that happened and that there was a uh, total lockdown in Susan Baranowski uh, uh, prison. And, and now we still have almost total lockdown in some facilities. And un, even though it's under the auspices of social distancing within a prison setting, uh, the conditions, uh, you know, we talked about suicidality and the impact of mental, uh, on people's mental health. And so that is also a very uh, significant concern. It, one of the things that was very problematic at the beginning of this crisis uh, was the lack of reliable uh, data about who is all eligible for release. Because one of the things that the ACLU, uh, when we filed this lawsuit or, or made the petition before the Supreme Judicial Court on behalf of uh, the Public Defender's Office and the Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys, is we were asking the court to uh, define entire categories of people who should be released to really stem the tide uh, of the spread of the virus. And in some instances, you know, in Berkshire County, and I know this ain't Berkshire, but, you know, just by way of reference, Berkshire County, the, the sheriff didn't want to share the information uh, with the district attorney so that they could work collaboratively uh, to find out who could be released. In Suffolk County, uh, there was a problem trying to get reliable data, not necessarily between the sheriff and the DA's office, uh, but with DOC. You know, who are the parolees who are over 50, or who are the people who are detained who are over 50 years of age, or who are in within six months of their sentence? You know, I have the pleasure of serving with uh, the sheriff on the state's uh, Justice Reinvestment Policy Oversight Board, which is intended to create a cross-agency tracking system so that we can have better data and better information so that we can begin to get a handle on these racial disparities and understand why they're why they exist and what are some of the inflection points within the system where they become exacerbated so you know these are some of the things that are problematic and i think finally one of the things that's really troubling to me uh, is the narrative out there that uh and you're right you know the the sjc just kind of uh, 
I don't want to say punted, but they they deferred to the executive branch to say uh, that certain remedies are beyond uh, the power uh, that, that, that they have or beyond their. Jurisdiction. I'll say it. I think they punted. Go ahead. Um, but you know, basically saying that it's up for the up to the DOC to uh, furlough people or, or uh, to parole to release more people or to expedite that, or for the governor to commute sentences um, or to grant people clemency, something that he has never done, uh, which is a, is a tremendous problem. Um, but the the narrative that has come out of uh, EOPS DOC is that we would release more people, but they don't have a place to go, which is just it's not true. Uh, th there are certainly people who are uh, not going to have homes to go to. Uh, there are people who will end up living with uh, living in homelessness, but but there's a large number of people who have family and loved ones to return to uh, that, that are waiting and willing to receive them. Uh, and so we really have to challenge some of these narratives. And we also have to make investments uh, to ensure that people are able to transition because you're right, as you pointed out, like these people were sentenced to a term of years, not to a death sentence. Thank you, Rasan. And I think it is important. The, you know, I think early on in this pandemic, some of the challenges we were looking at are, um, from from my point of view as a chair on mental health and substance uh, use and recovery, was when we release people and if we release people, we need to make sure that people are connected to resources, supports, housing support, and um, any of the behavioral health needs they have, whether they are in recovery, if they are on medical assistant treatment, and um, and struggling with addiction. Um, those are not insurmountable. Um, and, and maybe Liz, you could speak to some of this. I know at the moment, there are four pilot programs going on around the state um, that are working with people who are pre-released who are pre-released detainees. And the pilot works to make sure that they have um, all the services, including housing set up um, as they are getting ready to be released. Um, these are things that we certainly um, we, we know how to make sure people have their needs met in the same way that we wanted to make sure that everybody coming out is connected to mass health. And I'll say again, you know, I think Sheriff Katushin does a, a very good job at connecting people who are struggling with addiction. And for many, that is the only reason why they even landed um, in his, his care. And, and that that's never okay. But making sure that they're getting the resources and the services and the treatment that they need. Um, and so that becomes an opportunity for treatment, which should never be only done um, if you are um, either being held on um, a pretrial or uh, you have been sentenced to um, the House of Corrections. But um, Liz, do you want to talk to us a little bit more about um, where you see the the inequity um, of those who are on pre-release and how that's happening throughout different counties. And um, you know, I'll tell you, we continue to struggle with really wanting to understand those who are serving, um, who are incarcerated, understanding who has been um, put in isolation, um, who how we're dealing with the um, segregating populations of people who have COVID, people who don't have COVID. How are we making sure that people are safe? I'm getting phone calls from people saying that they're not accessing telehealth support because they're afraid of touching the phones because there's no wipes there. Um, and so these are the questions we've been asking the administration and I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. It looks like we're gonna have the chance to really get some of those answers more directly from them. Um, but if, if you would like to speak sort of what you're hearing and seeing. Sure, well, just a, a couple of things off of what Rasan had mentioned. Um, there is another case before the SJC now, which our office filed um, after the decision came out in the case that um, the ACLU represented the CPCS public defenders in, where only pretrial individuals were able to get relief, although the court did strongly suggest that more action should be taken. It, of course, wasn't binding on the, on the DOC or anyone, which is why we filed this case to try and get the court to force the governor and force those executive agencies to take action to release people who can be safely released. Um, and on that score, I also wanted to, um, this idea of the, the disproportionate impact also plays into the rhetoric around violent offenders. And uh, no one wants to talk about this, but we have to talk about it because it's uh, the conversation that's happening right now is nonsensical. And, uh, and there needs to be a correction also to this, um, the idea that's been put out there that violence is increasing in the city of Boston or elsewhere because of people who have been released pursuant to the court's order to release uh, people who are uh, nonviolent, um, who have 
who are pretrial and were not charged with violent offenses. Um, and I, I think the folks talking about it have been misinformed, whether it's Commissioner Gross or the, or the mayor of, of Boston or other people throughout the state of Massachusetts, the people being released are going through individualized determinations and, and folks are categorically excluded who have been charged with violent offenses, including gun charges. So those are not the people that the court ordered uh, be considered for release. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, but also this idea of violent offenders, there are people who, white people are disproportionately given more opportunities to plead to nonviolent offenses, even though they may have had charges that were violent in nature, but uh, folks of color are often uh, end up with uh, a sentence for a violent offense. So a lot of this is about plea bargaining and about how sentencing works in the courts. And is it's really a false dichotomy in many cases. Uh, also, we have to remember that people with quote unquote violent offenses are released every day. They're, they complete their sentences, they do rehabilitative programming in county jails and in prisons, and society says you've done your time and you can be released. And we accept that as a society. So we can't continue to incarcerate people just because they committed a violent offense at some point. If someone was going to be released a month from now anyway in, their, in a, one of these congregate settings in a prison or a jail where their lives are more at risk and they have a, an underlying condition where they could likely die if they catch COVID, it makes little sense to keep that person incarcerated. And so I think we have to think about this. It's a balance, but to say that it's common sense to not release people with violent offenses is really missing the bigger picture. Um, and so I wanted to, to clarify that. But on the reentry piece, sure, I mean, this whole thing, right, it's exposing a problem that's existed forever and that shouldn't exist. We have a problem with reentry here. We have more people being released or a lower incarceration rate, people in the community who have always lacked the resources to reenter society successfully. Um, there just aren't sufficient resources. And uh, many people succeed because of sheer will and perseverance uh, and because they have support of family members and people in the community, not because of an abundance of reentry resources out there. There just isn't enough there. We have clients who are dropped off every day at homeless shelters without social security cards, without being <laughs> enrolled in mass health is like they're supposed to be, um, without being connected to DMH, Department of Mental Health Services, so this is a chronic problem, and there are certainly counties um, in Middlesex is one of them that, that have more programs set up so that people um, can stay out of jail and out of prison. But by and large, they're lacking, and we certainly shouldn't be using that, our failure to provide those services and to have that safety net there as a reason to keep people incarcerated who, uh, who we know through the Department of Corrections own assessments or through many counties own assessments to be a low risk of reoffending in society. So it's just, we have to do a better job on the outside and then we can't use that also as a reason for uh, keeping people at high risk of, uh, of contracting a virus that is, uh, is still spreading through prisons and jails today, despite the fact that uh, our curve is going down in the rest of the state. I don't think that's the case um, in prisons and jails. Thank you, Liz. Um, Peter, I would ask you, um, is it possible to quarantine inside of a prison or a jail? And you know, what does that look like from your point of view in Middlesex and across the state? And, and then I'd also be interested in knowing more about what are the services that are available, the behavioral health services for people right now. Um, I know that Middlesex is part of the pilot program, the one of the four pilots that's happening right now for pre-release to people who are on pre-release and about to be um, in the process of being released back to their families and their communities. Um, I, I guess I would ask that, and then I, you know, we, we have a bunch of questions here, and there's also questions about how safe is it for people who are working in the jails and prisons? I, I know I got a call from a friend and a neighbor who's a social worker and was very concerned about her ability um, and her, her confidence, quite frankly, in a contracted company outside of the, the, um, the prison system third party contractor and keeping her safe um, and being able to um, keep both those who she serves and cares about and works with inside and, and also herself and her colleagues. You're muted. Um, so let me just say this, that our journey 
into this coronavirus situation began uh, right at the very beginning. As I said, I was the chairman of the Committee on Healthcare many years ago and dealt with pandemic issues, actually drafted a pandemic planning bill uh, after the bird flu of 2005. Um, and so I was kind of aware of how quickly these things can spread. In fact, uh, we began asking that internal, that those, um, those very preliminary uh, medical inquiries that used to be asked at all our doctor's offices, we started that on February 16th, I believe. So weeks before we got our first case. So we're already asking, have you traveled? Have you been in touch? What are your symptoms? Just as every other medical provider was asking on the way in. Our first case uh, hit us in early March. We were the first sheriff's office to have a positive inmate case. So yeah, that's a really frightening thing. It's frightening because you're worried for the health of the, uh, of the individuals in our care. <clears throat> you're worried that they're going to get anxious about their own health in there. Um, you're worried about that balance between climate and uh, public safety and public health, all that uh, together. Um, and so uh, I started working initially with Mass Bail Fund and then with District Attorney Ryan. Now, it was just mentioned that other counties weren't working together. Well, this is a county that was working together. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning that Marion and I began speaking early March about how we were going to provide opportunities for those that were on low cash bail uh, or others that could actually, we could get them out of our facility. And so even before you know, the uh, SJC decision came in. Um, Marion and I had worked, and I think we had, we had identified and or worked with the course to release 115 individuals um, to, to, to get them out of, our, out of our facility. And that didn't include, we doubled our numbers of the of bracelets, the electronic monitoring program for those with their sentence that we could find appropriate settings for. So what did this do for us, this decarceration? For many, it's a jurisprudential exercise, it's a social justice exercise. For me, it brought real results. So let me just, if, I, if you mind, if I show you that one slide there, uh, Marjorie. Um, let's see, where is it? Nope, that's not it. Here it is, okay. So here, if you take a look at the bottom, starting on March 7th, that's when this pandemic started hitting us. Our population was at 788 in Middlesex hey, County. Peter, now, but that's not, uh, Peter, I don't know what slide you have, but I'm looking at, I think, your calendar or your Zoom meeting calendar. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, we don't want you to see that now, do we? <laughs> Leave it up there. Leave it up there. <laughs> Maybe we do. No. Maybe you do. <laughs> you might get depressed. All right, let me just try this one more time. I'm going to stop share. I'm going to try it one more time here. Share screen. Here we go. All right. Is that okay? You see the graphs now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So as you can see on the far left, March 7th, it says um, 788. By the way, this is historically low. When I first became sheriff, um, you know, 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, it was 1300 to 1400. It kept getting 100 by 100 by 100. We never thought we'd see less than 1100 or 1000 or 900 or even 800. And there we were at 7088 at the beginning of this pandemic. You can see the number as of March of uh, May 22nd was 568. That is a significant you know, drop. It's 27, 28% drop in our population. And this is due to the SJC efforts. It's due to the work that Marion and I did. It's the work that I had done in identifying people for the mass bail fund. It's due to some parole releases. It's due to some end of sentences, right? This is all due to this. But what you can, so what did this allow me to do in order to help my population? It allowed me to empty out four of my five dormitory settings so that I could give social distancing, I could create more social distancing and protect the individuals from transmitting the virus because it was really hard to tell where it was. And the only dorm we kept, and, and this will be of interest to you, Madam Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, is the only dorm we kept open was that that was, was really uh, for, that, uh, for those with mental health issues. Because in corrections, uh, those that have struggled with mental health issues and might consider self-harm, you keep them in a dormitory style setting so that you can watch over them a little bit better and they can watch over each other. So we emptied all of our dorms except for one dorm. And now that the threat level has eased a bit, we've now opened up a second dorm. We're populating them at half levels so we can create that distancing inside. Above, you can see the churning of the population. I just bring this in just so people can understand how much our population churns. You can see on March 7th, we had uh, 67 releases and 87, 86 commitments. It rose to um, 136 releases on March 21st and 93 commitments. And you can see steadily those numbers have come down to be about 32 releases 
and 32 commitments. So we've hit pretty much around rock bottom or not rock bottom, but basically I think we've created a stable point. But I think when you can see that you have swings of uh, ranging anywhere from almost 100 to 200 per day, uh, per week of people coming and going, it's a challenge to manage in our places. And I think we've done well. And I'll just bring you to one more slide here so that you can see the number of tests. We've committed, we've completed 74 tests in our facility. Again, we were the first ones hit. And when we started, there were no tests around. We had to fight for some tests to be able to get them. And we started testing pretty aggressively. We've done 74 tests. Over this time period, we've had 33 negatives and 41 positives. Uh, we've got 72 of those that had tested positive have now recovered. Two are still being monitored. They're in medical isolation in their health services unit. And you can see even the testing as of recently, it started with many more positives than negatives. And now around uh, you know, the end of uh, April, the beginning of May, you can see it inversely inversing basically. And you can see more negatives now tests than positive tests as we come through this. In fact, our greatest threat right now is not those from the inside um, uh, you know, transmitting or becoming infected by the disease. It's those that are now being arrested by the police in the streets that are now actually positive when they enter our facility, known or unknown positive that come in. And that's some of our greatest threat right now. Again, shows the difference between a prison and a jail. We still take in all those new cases as assigned by the courts. And we just got to figure out how to deal with it and protect them and protect the individuals in our care and to protect the staff as well. You're muted. Sorry, yep. Um, I have a question for um, DA Ryan and then um, to Rasan. Um, I, I guess, has the pandemic offered an opportunity for the DA's office to rethink um, what criminal justice looks like and, and what charges are, um, are, being, are, are, are being held um, or charged with people, knowing that um, to send somebody even, in a, 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 even into the House of Corrections or the, um, to, to the jails, the sheriffs, knowing that it potentially could be a death sentence. Um, how has your office really grappled with this and what are the lessons to be learning through this pandemic that will maybe also carry us through? Um, uh, you know, there will be a post pandemic, I'm gonna say that. Um, we don't know when that is, but we're gonna keep transitioning and we have a responsibility to use this time that nobody asked for um, and to reimagine, you know, what a criminal justice system looks like if public health is the guiding principle, right? So if human rights weren't the guiding principle, public health now has to be the guiding principle because if any of us are sick, then all of us have the potential to be sick. Um, and so I just would ask you know, your thoughts on that. So I think there's two areas in which it has really, will be helpful to us going forward. The first is we, in Middlesex County, we are not asking that anybody be held if we're not gonna be asking for jail sentence at the end. So if we're asking for cash bail, that is already somebody that we have looked at the record, the facts of the offenses, balance public safety with the question of committing somebody. And we know that that's probably where we're going to be. We have obviously during this pandemic put into that equation, what is the risk about this person going into an institution, even with all that's been done to make it safe with the threat of COVID. And that has led us to release people that before this, frankly, doing that calculation, they're gonna get a committed sentence, they would not likely have had bail set and uh, or bail that they could meet and be released. And so that really has changed. What have we done? What are the conditions? How have been people been successful? We're looking very carefully at who's being released on what kind of charges. What are the conditions on which they are being released? One of the things I feel very strongly about is sometimes just to make ourselves feel like we've done something, I think in the process of arraigning people for years, lots of conditions get put on, which when you fail the condition, you then ended up in custody. Conditions serve a purpose. They only serve a purpose if they are really connected to what the needs are of keeping people safe and of treating whatever the underlying problem is. And I think as we've had people who pose more of a risk and we've developed, been developing conditions for them, when we look at them being successful, I think that's gonna tell us a lot about how we should be doing this better. And that's a process we already were engaged in, but it really is different. 
I think I mentioned before the partnership we've had with the police around really only making arrests when it was absolutely necessary. If they could summon somebody into court and let them go on their way, they should be doing that. That has to give us more conversation about are there things that are over-policed? And as we start to be post-pandemic and people are back out on the street again and things happen, where do we now set that marker? It's my hope we'll be able to put that in a different place than where we had it before. Thank you. Um, Brisson, you know, we know right now that depending on the zip code or the block that you're born in can say so much about what your outcome and what your life expectancy will be and, and what um, access to resources you have. I think we also know that um, depending on what county you live in, um, what city you live in, depending on who the DA is, depending on who the sheriff is, um, whether or not justice really is, um, whether, whether what justice looks like depending on uh, the color of your skin, or the access to your resources and your economic vulnerabilities or your immigration status, quite frankly. And it's not okay that, um, some, that some people will actually experience a better outcome um, based on their interactions with the criminal justice system based on the luck of, of what county they're in or who the, day, the DA is or who the sheriff ha happens to be. Um, I would ask you, we have, we have about 10, 12 minutes left here. And I'm gonna ask you and then Liz to also weigh in on um, what you think um, legislators and leaders need to hear from families who are, um, who, are related, who are part of justice involved families who have loved ones who are incarcerated at this time. Um, what are the changes that need to systemically be addressed um, through this pandemic to ensure that people are safe that it's not a death sentence and that they have the support that they need to actually be able to transition back into their neighborhood and their community. And, um, and what are the families, more importantly, need to hear from all of us, whether it's the sheriff, the DA, the state representative, um, that, that will ensure them that we actually care and that they're seen. Because I think often this is a population that is conveniently and deliberately invisible. <laughs> um, and, and we've really tied it up into these little boxes of why they deserve to be invisible and not seen and, and why it's just, or people who are serving time are getting what they deserve. Um, if you could speak to a little bit of that. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great uh, question. And I can't answer this question without first acknowledging my dear colleague and friend, Andrea James, who heads the organization Families for Justice's Healing and the National Council for Incarcerated Women, uh, Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, uh, who they have a consistent motto and slogan, nothing about us without us. So having conversations about what the needs of our of family members are, or the people who are incarcerated needs to involve and include uh, those people who are directly impacted, whether they're incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, or have loved ones uh, incarcerated. And the fact is that, uh, they can be heard, but people just aren't listening to them because they've been out. Like Families for Justice is Healing was one of the first organizations to send a letter to the governor demanding uh, the release of in entire classes of people to prevent the spread uh, of this um, of, of this disease. They, they've been pushing for, uh, um, instead of investing $50 million in uh, building a new women's facility, just like release people. Um, and invest those uh, resources in, in services in the community and community-based services, whether it's treatment um, or, or any other type of health services that people need. And, and so it's, it's really about people listening to the folks who are, are talking. Uh, again, I go back to the position that was in, in our petition, uh, which is there need to be entire classes of people who are released. Anybody who is parole eligible, people who are within, to Liz's point, people who are about to wrap uh, their sentence, who would have been released in a couple of months anyway, let's get them out before they contract this disease and die, uh, contract this virus and die. Um, you know, people who are susceptible uh, uh, to it, uh, to the virus. Uh, those are the folks who, who need to be released. And then there needs to be a, a concerted effort in making an investment uh, in services for, uh, for people who are being released. The amount of money that we spend incarcerating people, and I understand, right, it, the, the math isn't that simple, that if you just release a bunch of people, then the, the amount that you spend goes down automatically because there's a lot of fixed costs built in there. But it's really about 
shuttering entire facilities and repurposing a lot of employees so that they end up being service providers or working in some sort of service capacity uh, to support those who are reentering. But what this uh, pandemic has revealed to us is that we don't necessarily need the same level of enforcement and policing that we always had and that we make in that if we make greater investment in community-based services and resources that are culturally appropriate, uh, racially representative, that we'll get much better outcomes. Thank you, Rasan. And I think that that brings me to an important point with Liz, you know, an issue that you and I have worked on. I'm really proud to report out a bill out of my committee that would end the practice of sending people to um, civilly committing individuals who are struggling with addiction whose families have petitioned the courts to help them with addiction. And we've ended that practice for women, but we're still sending men who have uh, not broken the law, but whose families are desperate to get them help with addiction to jails to actually get support. And the bill that we reported out of my committee would end this practice. Um, I, you know, one of the counter arguments to that have been, well, we don't have enough places that provide those services. And it's just crazy, right? So recently, we are, as you know, I'm trying to thwart the ability for the state to spend over $5 million on more what's called Section 35, um, which is when somebody is, petitions the court to have a loved one sent to um, uh, for recovery treatment in, in the jails. So currently, when you talk about a, a redistribution of, of resources, why would we be spending $5 million in the middle of a pandemic to allow more people who have not broken the law to be put into jails, which we know are petri dishes for this virus and that essentially could kill them. Um, Liz, I, I guess I would ask you, um, what do you see um, in terms of um, the, the sectioning of people who are still being forced to, um, to go to jail for this? Um, and then also to speak to sort of what the experience is for families whose visitation has been disrupted. You know, it, it's, we're talking about people who are fathers, who are mothers, who are children, who are brothers, who are sisters. We're talking about our neighbors. We're talking about our loved ones, people who are coming right back into our neighborhoods, um, or for many of us who are coming back into communities um, and who are going to play really important roles in the health and the well being of a community, right? So, um, what are we saying to those families where those connections have been completely disrupted right now through COVID 19 and still aren't being released? But but aren't a danger and could be released. Right, thank you so much. Um, so a few things there, people are desperate for contact with their families. We're getting a lot of questions about this right now, uh, of course, from clients, but from family members directly. who are like, when can I visit my loved one? Um, there's, you know, there's no reports of COVID in the facility. Why can't I go there? Um, it, because it's very hard. You have to remember these are people struggling with uh, trauma, you know, the majority of the folks who are incarcerated are victims of trauma themselves and, uh, and struggling with substance use issues and with other issues. And they're locked in a cell for 23, 23 and a half hours a day. It's the most counter therapeutic you can thing you could possibly think of. Uh, and, uh, and that is, does really a, a lot of damage. We already know that conditions like that cause permanent psychological damage to people without mental health issues. Uh, and so we're doing this to people and also in the midst of cutting off uh, access to visitation and allowing them only a half an hour a day, uh, actually less than that, 15 minutes a day to make a phone call. Um, so people should have access to free phone calls, Audrey, especially Liz, right now. I just wanna say one thing, you know, you're not speaking about Middlesex here, you're speaking sweepingly about facilities across the state. I don't know which ones you're referring to, but we don't do that in Middlesex and neither do a lot of every other sheriff's office that I know. We still allow, we give four free phone calls of 20 minutes um, per week because we had to shut down the visitation. That's not lost on us. We have begun video programming and extra programming. That's not lost on us. So this is really important that when you're speaking about this, you don't see sweepingly about every correctional facility because there are some that are doing the right. We don't limit movement so, to Peter, one day in Middlesex. I don't want to get into a movement when there's been an outbreak, and then we have stepped it up based upon the recommendation of our infectious disease specialist. So you speak about this like everyone's doing the same thing. So We're Peter, not doing all that. Peter, I guess I would say, I would just ask Liz to finish. I'm not hearing this as a direct um, criticism of you. I think I started out this program by wanting people to understand the distinction um, between the different counties, um, as well as the distinction between those who are serving 
in jails versus the prisons. And so I, I certainly appreciate the concern about people believing that that's happening in your jails. Um, I think the concern is that I'm hearing this, and it's not in Middlesex, I'm hearing this around the state right now. Um, and as I shared with you earlier, is that if you were running all of our House of Corrections, I would be far less concerned. I totally understand uh, that, Margaret. Not that I the totally system that. doesn't actually have some totally real... Still, I understand that. The but system still has some issues. So I want to make sure people understand that it's not done everywhere that. across the board, too. You no, know, I, 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 I find that practice abhorrent and wrong myself. And so it's hard when I hear people speaking poorly of it, and I have to sit here and pretend like it's happening with me. I find that wrong. I find that inhumane. I find it unsafe. And, and, and unhealthy. So so I'm with you, Liz, on that stuff. So please just sometimes- So we're happy to have you as an ongoing ally and advocate, and you have used your role to speak out um, when it has not been comfortable against some of your peer colleagues. So that is noted and appreciated. And I won't take up any more time. Liz, if you could finish, we, we have five minutes before they just yeah. cut this off yeah. live. Absolutely, and I think the fact of the matter is the majority of people are subject to those conditions, and that's why it's important for me to talk about it because those are the people who we're accountable to um, in, in, in everyone should know that that's what most people are, are subject to right now. And, and not to get into back and forth, but no sharp is offering totally free calls. Many are offering uh, some free calls per week, which is great. And I think for many, that's as many as much as they need, but many need more than that. They have kids, they have parents, they have loved ones. And to the extent we can offer more, we should. And, I, and I'm sure the sheriff is, is amenable to that as well. Um, but in addition to that, I just want to make the point that the reason we have all been home uh, is because social distancing is the cornerstone, right, to uh, stemming the, the, flood, the spread of COVID-19. It's not because we don't have soap and water in our offices and we don't have, you know, masks and we can't clean high touch areas. But in prisons and jails, we have not created the ability to socially distance. There are some uh, counties and the numbers are way down in Middlesex, they're down in a couple of other counties as well, where there is more ability to socially distance. And I think you might see, see a flattening of the curve. You will see a flattening of the curve much faster in those facilities if they're actually using their space to socially distance. But in the Department of Correction, that's not possible. That's not what's happening. What we're saying is that we value these lives less and we're okay with having a lesser standard applied to this population because they're incarcerated. And, and I don't think anyone intentionally wants to say that, but that's in effect what's happening. Um, and until we rectify that with releasing people who can be released uh, and who should be released and providing the services for them to be integrated, and that is what we're going, that is what will be the legacy of for incarcerated people in this situation. So I just wanted to make that very clear and also make clear that testing, universal testing is something that the CDC uh, is saying if testing is available, people should be doing it in all jails and prisons. And it's really hard to know what the extent of spread is if you're not doing universal testing. Right. And we're starting to see that uh, in a number of, of areas right now. Did you want me to mention something else? Oh, on section 35. We've got yeah. 30 seconds. Yep. Section 35, yes. We're the only state in the country that is still incarcerating people who haven't been charged for a crime for substance use uh, treatment, and we shouldn't be doing it. We've stopped it for women. It's unconstitutional to continue it for men, especially right now. That's why we've included them as a subclass in our case. They should not be incarcerated for substance use treatment when their lives are being put more at risk for that and when they, there is space in community-based settings right now for those people. Um, so that's one. The other is on visitation. People need access to their family as soon as possible. The lockdown is not clinically indicated. And if it is, what we're violating people's constitutional rights in order to presumably to protect them from death. And that clearly is not a win winnable situation. And if we need to release people so we're not violating people's, people's constitutional rights, then that's what we should be doing. Marjorie, if I might, just one, I just want really, to Really, 20 seconds, Marianne. Okay. One of the things I think is important is this is public health and Middlesex, another way we've really been different very early on, both the sheriff and I retain separately an epidemiologist to help us with these decisions. So we are being guided by the science and the data, both in terms of making these decisions about who needs to be released and also about how we move forward in the courts. So I'm going to say again, um, I want to thank all of you and both Sheriff Katusian and DA Ryan. I think you guys have been at the forefront of your peers across the state. 
Um, and with an understanding that systemically the system also still is based in a way that always, um, I think, impugns um, that is no other way to say it, that it's just absolutely racist and classist. And we know that it disproportionately impacts and harms um, people who have less resources or who have a different skin color. And that is where I'm hoping that some of the best practices that you have established and your own values have driven those changes will actually, we will figure out how to ensure that that's what the rest of the state looks like. And Liz and Rasan, I also wanna thank both of you because your voices are voices of families uh, that may be out there organizing and engaging, but quite frankly, aren't being heard, aren't being believed, and it should not just be justice involved families that are leading the charge for these changes. And so I wanna thank you for all of your advocacy. We have a long way to go. This pandemic continues to rip open the curtain of, of what our society, uh, who it works for and who it doesn't. And we have an opportunity to actually fundamentally change that. Because again, if the changes we make aren't based on our, our motivation of human rights, they will be based on public health and, and quite frankly, um, our, our hope and our desire to protect ourselves. And so there's opportunities here, and I know all of you are working on that. Um, and I just am grateful to be in this world with each of you who are doing the work that you're doing. And um, I am emboldened to continue to dig deeper and to make sure that we do use this as an opportunity um, to reimagine what a criminal justice service system looks like and to reimagine what justice really looks like for justice-involved individuals and for those who've been harmed. Um, so thank you, all of you. To those of you who've asked questions that we did not get to, we will be back and we will ask, we could have another hour where this was just getting really good. Um, the conversation that really should be taking place amongst the four of you would be one that I think would be so important and so valuable. I know that you do that offline together in other ways, but I, I hope this gave the public an opportunity to get a glimpse of, of some of the complexities, some of the, the, quite frankly, the tensions, but ultimately the commitment that all of you bring to the, um, the, the many issues that are touching um, justice involved families and individuals and those who are incarcerated who we need to do better for um, so that this pandemic is not the death sentence that they were never intended to have to begin with. Thank you all of you and um, stay as well as you possibly can be. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.